Today I want to talk to you on Father's Day about a man who is prosperous, King Hezekiah, in the Old Testament and how God blessed his life. In fact, it sums up his life with this little phrase, and so he prospered. All of us want to prosper, amen? How many of you want to prosper today? And we find some great principles in life from this story as to how we can prosper. Let's join together in prayer. Father, thank you for this Lord's Day where we enter your gates together. We come together with the people of God in the house of God to enjoy the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, to hear the word of God that can change our life. May your word touch us, speak to us, and heal us today in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Thomas Carlyle, the Scottish essayist, said, for every person who can handle prosperity, there are a hundred who can handle adversity. How do we achieve prosperity and how do we handle it in a way that honors the Lord? The Bible tells us a story about a prosperous man, King Hezekiah, and how God blessed him. And his life becomes an example to us of how we can experience prosperity and blessing from the Lord. His life and ministry is summed up in 2 Chronicles 31, verse 20 and 21. The Bible says, this is what Hezekiah did throughout Judah, doing what was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God in everything he undertook in the service of God's temple and on obedience to the law and its commands. He sought his God and worked wholeheartedly, and so he prospered. And so, as a result of certain principles, he prospered. The Hebrew word prosperity means success. And success means to accomplish what you set out to accomplish. Success means to reach the goals that we have set. But this was not just a worldly success. It came from the blessing and grace of God because he honored the Lord and he went about pursuing God's purpose and plan. And the result of how he lived his life was the prosperity of God. And so he prospered. And we can prosper too by the grace of God. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned 29 years over Judah in the capital city of Jerusalem. The Bible tells us about his life in 2 Chronicles 29, verse 2. It says that Hezekiah walked in the ways of his father David, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Now, Hezekiah was really the great, great grandson of King David, but the Bible never speaks of grandparents. It only speaks of the patriarch of a family who's always the father. And David was the king who walked with God. And Hezekiah walked in the ways of of his father, David, a man who honored God. Now, that's not true of all the kings. Many of the kings, even in David's lineage, were wicked men. In fact, Hezekiah's father, Ahaz, was one of the most wicked kings Judah ever had. He filled the land with idolatry. He closed the temple where they couldn't even worship anymore. But Hezekiah, he walked in the ways of his true spiritual father, King David, you see, he wasn't bound by generational curse. He didn't let the wickedness of his father be repeated in his life. And I want to tell you that this is your generation. And whatever happened in previous generations does not define you or afflict you. You can serve God in your generation. You're never under a generational curse. His father was a wicked man, but he said, I'm going to serve God with my life. You have power over anything that happened in previous generations. This is your day. This is your generation, and we can serve God with all of our hearts. He was a man of great projects. He built and restored the temple of God. He had brought revival. He destroyed the altars in high places. Of pagan worship. He reopened the temple. He celebrated the Passover, which had not been celebrated since the days of King David and Solomon. He invited everyone from Israel. They came to celebrate the great Passover. And during it, the Bible says that he prayed for the people and the Lord healed the people. He was a man with a great military victory when the king of Assyria from the north, Sennacherib, 
brought his army down to the Holy Land and surrounded the city of Jerusalem. The Bible tells us that King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah prayed and God sent an angel. And an angel went out that night and put to death 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. And when King Sennacherib got up the next morning and saw so many of his troops had died during the night, he retreated in defeat and disgrace back to Assyria, the capital of Damascus. He went into the temple of a pagan god and his own sons killed him with a sword in an insurrection. It matters what temple we worship in and what god we bow before. He was a man who experienced miracles in his life. He got sick, terminally ill. Isaiah the prophet came and told him the word of the Lord. Get your house in order. You're going to die. That's Isaiah 38 and 1. I thought about preaching on that, but it's too depressing. <laughs> what a frightening word to hear from a prophet. Get your house in order because you're going to die. And Isaiah left the palace and was walking out of the courtyard. And Hezekiah turned, it says, toward the wall. And he prayed that God would heal him. And God spoke to Isaiah and said, go back and tell the king, I give him 15 more years on his life. And had a great miracle of God. And so he prospered. And God's will is that we prosper. God's will is not that we be poor. God's will is not that we fail. God wants to prosper and bless his people and give us his success. Moses told the people of this when they were about to go in the promised land in Deuteronomy 29 and verse 9. He said, carefully follow all the terms of this covenant so that you may prosper in the land the Lord is giving to you. When Joshua became the next leader of Israel, God spoke to him in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, and said to Joshua, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may be careful to do everything written in it, for then you'll make your way prosperous, and you'll find good success. What do we read about King David in 1 Samuel 18, 14? In everything David did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. In Proverbs 28 and 25 says, the one who trusts in the Lord will prosper. And how did Jesus put it to us in Matthew 6 and 33? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be given to you as well. And then the great apostle John gives us a blessing and a prayer. In that little brief letter of 3 John verse 2, he said, beloved, I would above all things that you would prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. Every good and perfect gift comes from Father God above. And God desires to bless and to prosper and to give his people success. Many people, when they think about prosperity, they only think about wealth, money. We live in a time that makes money the focal point of everything. It's like a man who was playing golf at a nice golf resort, and he was in the locker room with some other guys, and a cell phone went off on a bench. And so he hit the speaker phone, and a woman's voice said, Hey, honey, hope you're having a great golf game. He said, Hello, honey. She said, Listen, I just went by the mall, and she saw I saw a new leather coat. It'll be beautiful for this fall. and It's only $1,000. Do you mind if I get it? He said, No, get the coat. You deserve it. She said, Also stop by the Mercedes dealership. And I know I don't need a new car, but I've been looking at this new model. They have one, the color I want, with all these features on it. He said, how much is it? She said, $70,000. He said, well, you go ahead and buy it. And make sure you get all the options available. She said, one more thing. She said, I know we don't need a new house, but I've been looking at this new subdivision they're building. And they have just opened up the perfect home. I love everything about it. He said, how much is it? She said, it's $750,000. He said, well, go ahead and make an offer. And she said, thanks, honey, you're the best. And hung up the phone. And all the men are just staring at this man. He picked up the phone and he said, does anybody know whose phone this is? <laughs> We're talking about the prosperity and blessing of God upon our lives, not simply the material blessings of this world, although God will bless us financially and God will bless our businesses and our careers and our ministry and our family. And so he prospered. Why did he prosper? First of all, because of his personality. He prospered because of the kind of man he was. 
Many people think that prosperity comes from around them, so they're always working on their circumstances, but prosperity is the reflection of the character of a person. It is the quality of a person's character that creates everything about the world around them. Personality is your unique self, but it's more than that. Personality means character, attitude, values, your beliefs, your philosophy of life, your lifestyle. Personality is the quality of a person's relationship with God and with others. And it tells us of the kind of man he was here in 2 Chronicles 31, verse 20. It says that he was doing what is good and right and faithful before the Lord is God. And so he prospered because of the kind of man he was. He was a man of goodness. He wanted to do the right thing for the right reason. He was a man of faithfulness and dependability to God and in his relationships and in his responsibilities. So the kind of man that he was that God blessed. And the first principle of prosperity is that prosperity comes from the quality of a person's character. He was good. He was a sinner like the rest of us. He was imperfect like the rest of us, but he had a motive to do good. And it's more than moral integrity. Goodness in the Bible means to be loving and kind and beneficial and benevolent, to care about people. It tells us in Matthew 7, in verse 17, Jesus said, a good tree brings forth good fruit. And a bad tree brings forth bad fruit. And he was talking about character. Think about all the problems in the world today, all the problems that you hear about every day. Where do they really come from? They come from the heart of bad people. And all the good things in the world, all the blessings of the world, where do they come from? They come from good people with good intentions. And it tells us of our Lord in Acts 10 and 38 how God went about doing good, healing all who were under the power of the devil. The Son of God went about. Jesus could be with the rich and the poor. He could be in the palace. He could be in the hood. He could converse with Pharisees and Sadducees and politicians and rich men. But he walked among the common man. He ate with publicans and sinners. He was the friend of sinners. Jesus went about doing good. And Hezekiah could have just stayed in his palace. He could have lived in the life of luxury, but he was a good man and wanted to do good. And it's so important when we become prosperous that we don't isolate ourselves and just live in the lap of luxury, but that we too, like Jesus, go about doing good, helping people who are under the power of the devil. And so he prospered. And he did what was right. Now, that's a novel idea, that there's something right. We're being told there's nothing right or wrong. But there is right, and there is wrong. And it is defined by God, not by man. And he wanted to do what was right in God's eyes. It wasn't perfect, like we're not perfect, but that was his aspiration. I had a young man at his wife and counsel one time. They'd only been married a year or two. They're, they were having a lot of problems, and he was doing things that would derail any marriage, and he realized his marriage was in trouble, so they came to see me, and he was kind of turning over a new look for the last new leaf in life, like he's going to make all these changes because his marriage was on the rocks, and I remember as I talked to them, he said, Pastor, he said, I, he said I've made changes, he said, but I, I've been doing right, and, and bad things keep happening to me. I said, well, it takes more than two weeks. And I said, furthermore, that's impossible for a man to do what is right and get wrong results because the Bible says a man reaps what he sows. I said to him, it is impossible for you to do the right thing in the eyes of God and your wife and for bad things to happen. If you do the right thing, right things will happen to you. And Paul the Apostle talked about his own ministry in the apostles. He said in 1 Corinthians 8, and 21, we are taking great pains to do what is right in the eyes of the Lord and in the eyes of men. It takes great pain sometimes to do what is right. We can't just think of political expediency. That's why politics are corrupt. 
when a person in leadership stops doing what is right and only thinks about what they're going to get out of it. That's what corrupts every system. When they stop asking the question, is this right in the eyes of God, in the eyes of men? He was good. He tried to do what was right. And so he prospered. And he was faithful. I love the virtue of faithfulness because it's within our reach. We can't be perfect. We reach for it, but it's always beyond our reach, isn't it? But now faithfulness, we can, we can get our hand on that. That's something we can grasp. We can all be faithful and dependable and honest and true and genuine and a person that other people can count on and a person the Lord can count on. One thing we can all do is be faithful to our word, to our commitments, to our values. It tells us in 1 Corinthians 4 and 2, those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. And notice the motivation for the goodness and righteousness and faithfulness. He did these things before the Lord his God. Emphasis on the phrase his God. Many people talk about God as an outside entity. But he had a relationship with God, his God. In fact, it uses that phrase twice in this passage about his life. The Lord, his God, he had a relationship with God like his father David did, the man who was after God's own heart. He walked with God. And everything he did, he did before, as though he was performing for an audience of one. He did what he did before the Lord in full view of God. And our lives are changed when we live our lives in the presence of God. And we do what we do before the Lord. In other words, we seek first to honor the Lord. And if we will honor the Lord in the way we live, God will prosper us. We don't have to manipulate and control the outcomes if we will do what we do before the Lord, trying to honor him and please him the best that we can in our own imperfections. We too will prosper. You see, the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 7, if a man's ways please the Lord, not everybody else, if a man's ways please the Lord, he'll make even his enemies to be at peace with him. Think about that. If you and I would just please the Lord in the way that we live, he'll come down here and stop our enemies from attacking us. And we worry too much about pleasing everybody, which is impossible and leaves us a nervous wreck. He did what he did before the Lord. He performed for an audience of one. And if we please the Lord, we'll be the most beneficial to those around us. And Jesus talked about it in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. He said, be careful that you do not do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, then your Father in heaven will give you no reward. He talked about the secret life of the salvation. Do what you do before the Lord. And he said, when you give to the needy, don't stand on the street corners and announce it like with a trumpet or in the synagogues like the hypocrites do. But don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. And your father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. you. Say, nobody sent me the card. Nobody told me thank you. Nobody gave me a promotion. And God who sees what you do in secret will reward you. The reward does not come from this world. It comes from heaven. And when you pray... Don't stand on the street corner like the hypocrites are in the synagogue who pray to be seen by men. But go into your closet and shut the door and pray to your Father in heaven and your Father in heaven who sees what you do in secret will reward you. Perform for an audience of one. Build your business in the eyes of God. Glorify him. Launch your ministry before the Lord for the glory of God. Raise your family before the Lord, all for the glory of God. And so he prospered. And so he prospered. God watched him. And God blessed him. There was a man one day walking past the construction site of a great cathedral, and there was a sculptor there. He'd been fashioning these beautiful 
small statues and figurines, and they were going to be placed high on the top of this great cathedral. And he asked the sculptor, he said, why are you taking so much meticulous care and detail with these figurines when you put them on the top of the cathedral? Nobody will be able to see them. The sculptor said, God will see it. Well, nobody saw what I did at work. God will see it. Nobody thanked me for what I did for the family. God will see it. Nobody acknowledged me for what I did in ministry. God will see it. The first principle of prosperity is personality, the kind of men and women we are, wanting to be good and helping others, doing it what's right and being faithful and dependable and performing for an audience of one, God himself. And then he was prosperous because of his projects. I love this phrase here in 2 Chronicles 31, verse 21. It says, in everything he undertook. I want to ask you today, what are you undertaking? What are you working on right now? What projects have you got going on in your life? And everything he undertook and all the projects that he did in service to God's temple. He was a man of projects. He had ideas and he had plans and he had dreams. I, I'm a, conscious of the fact that so many Christians today are so passive in their own life. They're, it's like we're too afraid of making a decision. We're so paralyzed because we don't know everything about God's will. When many of the things in your life are not predetermined, if you will start a project for God's glory, God will bless it. You've got to give God something to bless in order to prosper. It's like people who stand still and say, I'm praying for direction. Well, the Bible says in the Psalms, the steps of a good man, a woman, are ordered by the Lord. If you're not taking steps today, you're giving God nothing to direct. God does not direct people who are standing still, hiding in a prayer closet, waiting. Because I can tell you something about waiting on God. God is slow. But when you put your hand to a project and say, Lord, I'm doing this to honor you and get God's attention, God will bless what you're doing, what you're undertaking, your projects in your life. Give God something to bless. He took these great projects in life. It's not the projects we think about doing. That's certainly fine to do or pray about doing. That's great. It's the projects we put our hand to. What are you putting your hand to today? What do you have your hand on? Not what do you have your mind about. What do you have your hand on today? What have you undertaken with your hand? When Moses pronounced the blessings of God in Deuteronomy 28, verse 12, he said, may God bless all the work of your hands. You see, you've got to work with your hands to give God something to bless. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might, Ecclesiastes 9 and 10. And he did it in the service of God's temple. He wanted to glorify God in all the projects and work that he did. Whatever you do, work out with all your heart. is working for the Lord, Colossians 3 and 23. And so he prospered because he was a man that would undertake great projects in life. And I encourage you to set goals and start working on projects. And every project in your heart, I would encourage you to work on that project. Personal projects. Advance your own career. Take new courses. Take more training. Start that business. Start that ministry. Start that hobby that you've been interested in. Get to work on projects in your life. Never have a season in life when you don't have a project. Don't retire, refire, and keep working on a project. People will come to me about music and they say, I'd like to record some music or I want to write a book. And whatever the projects people bring to me, I say, do the project. And don't worry about how many people see it. Just do it because you want to do it. It's in your heart. And bless as many people as you can. But if it's a project that is in your heart, I encourage everyone to put your hand to that project and make it happen. And have family projects. My dad declared Saturday as work day. We had five kids. Work day. He called Saturday work day. 
And we lived across from the a little park. I played in the park every day. I would get Saturday morning, right? Can I go to the park? No, today's work day. I think, well, tomorrow is Sunday. And that's no fun. We got to go to church in the morning and the evening. And to a kid, that feels like work day. And we got five days of school days, and the school runs, ruins the night because they give us homework. I think we should pass education reform. When school is out, that's it. We'll see you all the, tomorrow morning and get back to work. And the kids said, amen. <laughs> now I've got work day. We had a big yard. My parents owned the woods behind the yard. Early Saturday morning, we're out there dragging brush out of the woods up to the road, cutting the grass. We used to dig dirt in the backyard. Dad wanted to move this dirt from here to there. And about a month later, you'd move it back to the other side. <laughs> and they tried to make it really good because they always had like a, a container with ice and Cokes. We had Czech Cola. You ever had Czech Cola? I think we're living in Atlanta, the home of Coca-Cola. Czech Cola? It was an upgrade when we got Fanta. Fanta Great was my favorite. And that was the trade-off. Workday and Czech Cola. But he kept us working. I remember when David Paul and I built the Gettysburg Battlefield. Son, you hear, you remember this? We worked so hard. Man, we had the best battlefield. We got these little soldiers, the blue and the gray, and we worked so hard on that and had Gettysburg written on it, and Barbie took pictures of us. I still have it. Look at that project sometime. Remember how much we put in that project? I mean, Charleston, I had to build a solar system. She was in elementary school, and we had to go to Michael's. Thank the Lord for Michael's. If you don't have a project, go to Michael's. You'll have one before you walk out the door. All these styrofoam balls, different sizes, like the planet, and had us a box, and we're going to suspend them and make the solar system. I spray painted the whole, spray painted the whole thing black, and then we took fluorescent paint. It was a psychedelic, psychedelic fair, man. We have our picture, Charles Me standing by the universe, and black light going, psychedelia, and Barbie's taking a picture. It's one of the great moments. We had projects. Paris, don't let your kids sit idle. My mother told me, she used to say, David, idleness is the devil's workshop. I used to think that was in the Bible. Idleness is the devil's workshop. Don't let your kids sit idle. Do not let them sit by and let life pass. Do projects with them, family projects. Take them on vacation. Put them on book reading schedules. Keep those kids building and working on projects. Don't let them sit at home and stare at that cell phone and social media and computer. Get them on a project. And everything he undertook, what are we undertaking today? We giving God something to bless or not? And church projects, since I've become your pastor, we've been on a project, an endless project, haven't we? We built a whole new campus, and we refreshed it after the pandemic. Now we're building a youth center. We've done new missions projects. We're involved in the inner city. I've always got some project. We are never going to sit by as a church and watch life happen. We're going to put our hand to a project and give God something to bless. And Hezekiah had... Demolition projects. He tore down the altars and all those idols of the land. And there are times you've got to just demolish some things. That's a great project. He had restoration projects when he reopened the temple and refreshed the temple and opened it back up for services again. He had construction projects. He built walls around the city to protect them from an enemy. He built watchtowers for guards. He built villages and communities and subdivisions for the people of Israel to live in. He had innovation projects. He thought outside the box. He actually came up with the idea of a great aqueduct system, and they had to dig through solid rock. They built a hidden aqueduct system so they could bring water into Israel, flowing into Jerusalem and the round and areas. So if an enemy came, they couldn't even find the water supply, that they would never run out of a water supply. You can go to Israel today, and you can look in the tunnel of Hezekiah where they carved out this underwater aqueduct system, something that had never been done. Let me tell you something. The way to make your life come to a grinding halt is to live on yesterday's ideas and yesterday's passions. We've got to forget what happened yesterday. We cannot be tra trapped by the traditional thinking of a previous generation. We need new ideas and fresh ideas for God to speak to us and teach us how to live and prosper in this generation. 
And then he had generational projects. He started projects that benefited generations to come. He reversed their whole economic trend. He built a storehouse and began to accumulate wealth and build an endowment for future generations instead of living on borrowed money the way that we're doing today, driving up our national debt. We're crippling future generations because we're only indulging in the moment. But he changed that. He said, no, we've got to prepare financially for generations to come. He built a storage center for food so that if a famine came or an economic downturn, the people could have food supplies. He thought of the generation to come and may we, always think of the generation and as a church we've got to put our teenagers first we've got to put our children first we've got to put our preschoolers first we've got to put the babies in the nursery first we've got to do what we're doing for the generation to come we cannot afford to be a people that just live for the moment we've got to build for the generations to come and raise up another generation of champions for Christ and everything he undertook you and I have got to undertake something great. Let's give God something less. And finally, he prospered because of his prayers. It's interesting in the story of Hezekiah how often the word prayer appears. He sought his God, and may it be said of us, we are people who seek our God. And there it is again. He sought his God, his relationship with God. What a challenge to us men on Father's Day to be men who seek our God. What are we seeking for? What are we chasing? What are we pursuing? What are we running after? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon while he, is, while he is near. Isaiah said in Isaiah 55 and 6, God said, you will seek for me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Jeremiah 29 and 13, Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. What are we seeking for in this generation? What is our passion? What is our pursuit? The three great moments of prayer in his life, he prayed for deliverance when the enemy came. King Sennacher brought that army down. The Bible tells us in 2 Chronicles 32, verse 20, King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah cried out to the Lord in prayer to heaven. And God sent an angel. Think about that. They cried out to the Lord, and God sent an angel. God sent divine intervention. If you and I will cry out to the Lord, God will send an angel in this generation. God will send a divine intervention. It's the angel of the Lord that intervened in that war. And when he was sick, and Isaiah came and told him, get your house in order, you're going to die. It tells us in 2 Chronicles 32, verse 24, that when he was ill and would not recover, that Hezekiah prayed to the Lord and God gave him a miraculous sign. Isn't that incredible? He prayed to the Lord and God gave him a miraculous sign. They cried out to the Lord and God sent an angel. He prayed to the Lord and God gave him a miraculous sign. Our God will still send an angel. Our God will still give us a miraculous sign. And then when he sinned, as we all sin at times, we all fall short. He prayed a prayer of repentance. Because it tells us in 2 Chronicles 32, verse 26, that Hezekiah became proud in his heart. It did not respond to the kindness that had been shown to him. Therefore, the Lord's wrath, his displeasure came upon Hezekiah and the people of Judah and Jerusalem. But Hezekiah repented of the pride of his heart and the Lord did not send his wrath on Judah during the days of Hezekiah. He was a man who, when he did wrong, when he got off track, he repented, said, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me, cleanse me, give me a fresh start. And so he prospered. And so he prospered. And so will we. Would you stand with me for prayer this morning? I want, to, I want to pray for all of our men and our families today, and I want to pray a, a prayer of prosperity over you. How many of you want God to prosper you? I know I do. A new level of prosperity, a new level of success. Let's pray, Lord, we thank you today. We like Hezekiah and the prophet. We cry out to you, Lord, to deliver us and to heal us. We too, Lord, repent of our sins when we get off course. 
Forgive us for the pride of our hearts when we don't depend on you. I pray, Lord, for the great men of this church. I thank you for them and their loyalty and faithfulness and diligence, and sacrifice and service that you'll bless them. I pray for young men that you'll bless them and raise up a generation of young men to serve the Lord. Bless every family, Lord, with healing. I pray for every family, Lord. All of our families have issues. We have unsaved loved ones. We have problems. And Lord, today, I pray for the miracle of household salvation, that not one person in our families will be lost, but that all will come to know you through faith in Jesus. And Lord, I ask you for a new season of prosperity upon your people in the workplace, in their finances, Lord, in their health, in their ministry, in their family, in their relationships. Lord, today, I pray you'll bring an anointing of prosperity and increase in the lives of us, your people. If you believe it, just say, Lord, I receive the prosperity of the Lord today, and I give you praise. Come on, let's give him praise. He's worthy of all glory and honor and praise. I trust that you and your family have a great Father's Day. Come by the Great Hall. It is a blast, and we won't get the Mount Perrin Coke. In fact, we need to send one to Coca-Cola. They need to see what we've done there. God bless you. Have a great day with your family. I love you. I'm praying for you. See you next Sunday for worship. Happy Father's Day. Thank you for being a part of the service today. And certainly, we've enjoyed being able to share with our fathers and thank the men of our church for their great leadership and support. I'd like to ask you to subscribe to the Mount Perrin YouTube channel and also my personal YouTube channel where you can listen to the messages and share the ministry together and keep up with all the events going on. And make sure you leave us a comment. Tell us where you are in the world and also how we can pray for you. You can subscribe to my podcast, my sermon podcast. Here, the Bible study that I put out every week as well as the Sunday messages. And again, just drop me a comment. Let me know you're out there. If you enjoy the Bible study and the messages, and certainly if you're studying with me each week, I'd love to hear from you as well. Thank you so much for being a part, a faithful part of the Mount Perrin ministry, for your prayers, your service, and your support in every way. we got a great Sunday plan next week. We're looking forward to seeing you and your family with us in worship. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.